My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer America. I'd be willing to make friends. I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain you, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. If everybody tries to get out of everything ahead of everyone else, then at what point is everybody gone? Well, that was the theme of our investment club call at noon today. It's what I saw all day, with the Dow ultimately slipping 164 points, S&P declining 1.15%, and the Nasdaq tumbling 2.26%. We are seeing a circus of downgrades and large price target cuts as the analysts try to get ahead of each other, downgrading and cutting price targets, regardless of how low these stocks have gone already. It's abundantly clear that right now it feels like no price is safe enough to buy. None. Nothing can get too low. Doesn't matter if the stock's already down 50%, 60%, 70%, or more from its high, as so many are. Because the bears will tell you they never should have been up that much in the first place. Doesn't matter if those stocks are selling at four or five times earnings, because the bears will tell us they'll never be able to meet the estimates anyway. The real numbers will be much lower. Nothing seems to matter except getting out ahead of the other guy, which is a little funny when you remember we've been in a bear market for seven months. And when it comes to technology, the worst area, don't even ask. This group gets nonstop hate every single day. It is just despised. With much of it aimed at the semiconductor and internet stocks that I think have been hard hit, maybe too hard hit, even as the companies may or may not be doing well, although you can bet that the strong dollar is crushing all of them overseas. Remember, I think we're going to be able to asterisk that, that people are going to ignore that, but that is crucial. Make no mistake, the bears have seized control of the radio station, and that's their narrative. But it's not how I think. To me, this mad scramble to get out ahead of the negativity is a sign that the bad news, with the exception of the dollar, is mostly baked in. I actually feel a lot more constructive. That's the word I chose to go into tonight. Constructive about this market than I did a month or two ago. I bet there could easily come a day where we even get slower consumer data and the Federal Reserve realizes they don't need to raise interest rates as aggressively as they previously thought. Once that happens, this whole process will be reversed. You'll see the analysts panicking in the other direction, raising price targets, upgrading stocks, as they recognize that the sellers have dried up and the buyers suddenly went in. They went in because they were just waiting for a sign that the Fed would take its foot off the, uh, off the brakes. And that will happen, people. It will happen. I'm not saying it'll happen immediately. But given the collapse in commodity prices and a glut of many goods and even a looming excess in homes because of newfound deal cancellations, it's much easier to believe the Fed can beat inflation without wrecking the whole economy. But we're stuck with the fear for the time being, which is why I want to go over the game plan for this week so you know exactly what people are so scared of because it is staring right in front. Now, it starts with macro numbers. I'm not going to start with the, stock, with the companies. The macro numbers, all right? And it's really important that people recognize that we're, we're going to get on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is the consumer price index, the producer price index, and the retail sales numbers. I think those figures will be too hot and will be more important than any of these companies. Uh, there's just too much inflation. But I also expect some early signs of cooling, especially retail sales, as consumers are already starting to run out of money that they saved during the depths of the pandemic. Now, that's something that Craig Jelinek of the CEO of Costco kind of suggested this morning on Squawk on the Street, although he added it might just be because the consumer has everything she needs, which is also bad for retail, although not for Costco, which crushed the numbers. In general, though, these data points are what everyone's afraid of. And when everyone's petrified, it tends to be a non-story with buyers coming in after the big bad event passes. But it's those CPI, PPI, and retail that have caused so much of the selling today other than the downgrades and the price cuts. How about individual companies? All right, tomorrow people will be dissecting PepsiCo, which reports in the morning. I have a lot of confidence in these guys, and I think they can tell a very good story now that so many of their input costs have come down huge from their highs, especially corn and aluminum, 
We heard a great story from Coca-Cola recently, and I think that Pepsi can tell a similar one when it comes to carbonated drinks, maybe even a great one when it comes to snacking at home, with Frito-Lay, provided that transportation costs are under control and we don't have to hear too much about fuel. Wednesday, we hear from Delta Airlines, and I think the consumer still... It, it still isn't done traveling. See, that's the thing. It may be done and may have everything they need at home, but they're not done traveling. We just saved so much money and missed out on so much travel during the worst of the pandemic, so now all the planes are filled. In fact, if Delta says, says things aren't good, that would be a true revelation. Thursday, the bears begin, uh, the banks begin reporting. It's, actually, that's a nice Freudian slip because the bears are reporting. The banks begin reporting. We're all getting used to these stocks getting crushed after they report. But what if they're so far down this time that there's nowhere left to go but up? Remember, the banks instantly become more profitable every time the Fed raises interest rates. And by the way, that's because they can invest at a higher rate than they'll pay you. Your rate at your checking account is not going to go up that much. I think the more that this happens, it offsets any damage that could cause by a potential, because there isn't yet, a potential increase in bad loans. It's amazing to me that when their net interest margins were much lower, the bank stocks were much higher. Now that their net interest margins are high and the stocks are low, yet they're still hated, that makes no sense to me. It, it, it could produce some spectacular results. That's why I like Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan ahead of their quarters. Granted, their trading business lines have been very weak, and that is a good reason to sell, but not enough. Everybody knows it already. According to St. Louis Fed, the one with the best information, loans were still strong this quarter. That, if, that's, that is as of Friday. I think the bank stocks, which have been a frigid wasteland, could become a hot place to put your money. They usually work at this point in the business cycle. I particularly like Morgan Stanley because the franchise is too cheap and they give you a good dividend. So if, it, if I'm wrong, it will still not go down that much. That may be the best one to be in. Also on Thursday, we get results from ConAgra, the packaged food company. Now, I see this as a decent situation. ConAgra has a lot of good brands that are just getting better, not to mention it's 3.5% yield. The value proposition is pretty compelling here, especially thanks to working from, from home. Remember, there's a lot of snacking. That's something that I said would help Frito-Lay. Then there's Cintas. Now, this is a company that supplies uniforms and provides other services for small, medium-sized businesses. I used to love it when it merged with its largest competitor. These days, I just listen to the conference call. Get a check on the pace of job creation, as I am no, not sure we'll have any acceleration right now because of what it's become of this kind of nationwide gloom. I mean, we talked about that with Marty Musi. Remember that from Paychex? They still have good business formation, but there's some concern that things are, uh, let's, you know, they're gloomy. Friday, another bank day. And we start with Wells Fargo. Now, this stock sold off hard after failing to grow much last quarter and higher expenses. I was infuriated by that. The company tells me that, look, there's some real regulatory issues they're still working through. We own Wells for the Travel Trust, and we cannot believe it's gotten so low. But this is a bank that is under a lot of federal pressure to do what is right, much more pressure than I thought they would have at this point since Charlie Scharf, the CEO, took over. OK, at this price, though, I think there is little to lose with Wells Fargo and a lot more to gain. Then there's Citigroup. Citi is a total conundrum, people. Its book value is much higher than its stock price, yet that means nothing to prospective buyers. Nothing at all. Lots of people ask me, how can I not want to endorse this one, given that it's just ridiculously cheap on book? But until I see some actual earnings momentum, I'm not going to go positive. There are better banks to own. We also get results from BlackRock, which I like very much here. I couldn't believe when I saw some negative analyst chatter about this great company ahead of the quarter. I think BlackRock's a terrific core holding that rarely comes in because its CEO, Larry Fink, has a clearly defined vision of what his firm should do. And by the way, he is a technology fiend. They have the best fintech. Finally, there's United Health, a fantastic, consistent health insurance organization that should have a very good quarter, particularly because COVID is now not as threatening to the public as flu in terms of fatality and length of time in the hospital. The business does have some cyclicality. If there are a lot of layoffs, its numbers can weaken. But we're not seeing that yet. Otherwise, you've got my blessing to just keep buying. That said, we prefer Humana for the Chapel Trust. Said that today on our conference call. It's much, much cheaper than United Health. Although lately, we've been scaling out of it simply because it's had such a giant run. Bottom line, everybody's scrambling to get out of this market ahead of everybody else. But at this point, I think many people who are going to sell have already gone which means we could get some pleasant surprise going forward. Let's go to Ann in Indiana. Ann. Jim, thanks for taking my call. Oh, of course. Thank you for calling. 
Yeah, I'm a club member. I love the call today, but Thank I you. wanted to dig a little deeper into Eli Lilly. I have a two-part question. Mm -hmm. One, do you feel concerned as the PE gets higher? And two, in addition to holding the stock long, I have been learning to buy some options from your book, Getting Back to Even. Thank you. So I have some deep in the money calls. And this sounds retarded, but I swear I could have gone out even further for the same amount of money. And I'm like, oh, I guess I should have done that. Uh, that does happen, yes. I always tell you to go out further because they're surprisingly a bargain versus the near term. But don't feel tough on yourself. What you're doing is right. Now, the reason why Lily seems cheap to me is because I am looking at some of the remarkable things in their pipeline. They've got four, five, six, seven billion dollar drugs that you're just beginning to hear about. And that makes it so the E, the estimated E or earnings, are probably going to be lower than uh, the, the, the P.E. is going to be lower because the estimates are going to have to move up dramatically. And that's what I think is going to happen. So it's not nearly as expensive as it looks right now. It seems like everyone's scrambling to get out of this market ahead of everybody else, doesn't it? But I think most people who are going to sell have already done so. So we could get some positive surprises going forward if we just get numbers that are okay. On May Money tonight, ServiceNow is its finger on the pulse of thousands of companies. So I'm sitting down with the company's top brass to get a read on the health of the enterprise spending in this environment and, of course, the strong dollar, which is very, very, very uh, disconcerting to a lot of companies. The, oh, and then how about, how about who's buying and who's selling? The commercial hedgers are bullish, while the public's gotten very bearish. Who's right? I'm going off the charts with the help of Larry Williams to find out. And a few months ago, Chipotle introduced us to their chip-making robot known as Chippy. And tonight, I'm talking to privately held Miso Robotics to see how they're, equi uh, they're equipping some high-profile businesses with the robots they need to improve their operations and to cut their costs. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.